I love bananas. I mean, they're amazing with oatmeal. They take pancakes to the next level, and they're a delicious, healthy, and portable snack. But another reason that I like bananas so much is that I can relate to them. Yes, I can relate to a fruit. Now I know this may seem strange, but hear me out. Bananas are a sweet white fruit hidden inside of a bright sunny yellow peel. They carry two completely different identities within them. They're one thing on the outside, yet something completely different on the inside. So am I. You see, I was born in China, and according to 23andMe, I'm genetically 99% Chinese. However, I was adopted by my American parents when I was only nine months old. So, despite my DNA profile, I don't really feel 99% Chinese. While my parents incorporated aspects of Chinese culture into my life growing up, through food and dance classes and stories, I grew up mostly in the culture of mainstream America with white American parents, speaking English, grilling hamburgers, and celebrating Thanksgiving. When someone asks me where I'm from, I automatically reply that I'm from the United States, that I'm an American. I don't even have to think about it. But while this is obvious to me, it isn't so obvious to others, because when people look at me, they often see the outer, visible Chinese part of my identity, not my inner American one, and they associate with me based on the version that they can see, the Chinese me. Sometimes it's difficult to have to deal with the obvious disdain of the Chinese woman in the fruit market when she realizes that, despite my appearance, I can't understand the Mandarin that she's speaking in. And it's annoying to deal with the follow-up question, "But where are you really from?" When I say that I'm from the United States. Now, I know the term "banana" when describing Asian Americans can be seen as offensive for some, and I'm not defending any slightly racist undertones of this term. But for me and many other transracial adoptees, the banana is a metaphor that works. Transracial adoption is when a child is adopted by parents who are different than their race. Most often, the child is from a non-white developing country, and the parents are white and from a developed country. Quite a few transracial adoptees report feelings of confusion around their identity, especially in their teenage and early adult years. And this is where some of the criticisms of transracial adoption begin. Now, many people think that placing abandoned and neglected children with loving and caring parents is a wonderful thing. The Institute of Family Studies reports that in the last decade, transracial adoptions have increased by 50 percent in the U.S. However, this in- increasing trend of international transracial adoptions has caused some concern and controversy for others. The first criticism is the aforementioned identity issues. A person's identity is inextricably tied to both their appearance and their experiences. So, for transracial adoptees, the forming of a personal identity can be more difficult. Society looks at them and associates them with the culture of their appearance, when reality is much more complicated. So many transracial adoptees end up having two conflicting identities: the culture associated with their appearance and the culture in which they were raised. Both of these are per- crucial to how they perceive themselves and how they're perceived in society. And when they don't align, it can cause identity confusion for some children. Some transracial adoptees report not feeling as if they belong strongly enough to one culture. For example, Asians adopted by Americans say that they don't feel Asian enough because they didn't have an Asian cultural upbringing, yet that they also didn't feel white enough because of the way they look and the way they're sometimes treated. Another criticism is that the differences between white parents and non-white children can harm the children. These people say that white parents won't be able to relate to whatever degree of bigotry their child will face as a minority. They also say that these children are more likely to be bullied because they look different from other children. A more practical problem raised is that a white parent won't know how to adequately deal with the care and styling of a black child's hair, and others say that white parents won't know enough about their child's culture of origin and will deprive them of their cultural heritage. For example, the National Association for Black Social Workers and the National Indian Child Welfare Service have historically opposed transracial adoptions, thinking that a child who is of color cannot fully develop a cultural identity when being raised in a primarily Anglo home environment. 
And a more extreme criticism of transracial adoption is that it is a manifestation of white supremacy in what some call the white savior complex. For these people, transracial adoption is an attempt by white people, either consciously or subconsciously, to rescue inf children from inferior cultures and bestow upon them the benefits of superior white culture. For example, when Judge Amy Coney Barrett was being considered for appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, she was criticized on social media because she had adopted two Haitian children. She was labeled a white colonizer who was using her children as props in her lifelong pictures of denial. Now, as a transracial adoptee myself, I was very interested to hear of these concerns, and it's led me to question how valid they might be. I do think that there is some validity and truth to them. I can see that it's difficult to have two different identities and that it could lead to some stress or confusion for some children. But I also had to wonder, is this bad enough to discredit transracial adoption altogether? And to answer this question, I had to consider the alternative that these children face if they weren't transracially adopted. And I had to specifically look at my own alternative. And to understand my alternative, one must understand the social, political, and economic context out of which I was adopted from China. Now, I'm not going to give you a Chinese history lesson, but it is important to know that in the 1970s, Chinese food production was greatly outpaced by population growth because many couples were still having up to six children. The government tried to curb this by encouraging couples to have children later and to have less children when they did so. But despite these efforts, population was still growing at an unacceptable rate, so the government decided to take drastic action and introduced their one-child policy in 1980. This policy made it illegal for couples to have more than one child. Families who violated the policy were fined amounts equal to several years' salary. They were fired from their jobs, and sometimes they were even subject to forced abortions or sterilizations. The policy was also enforced through a type of neighborhood watch. Neighbors were incentivized by monetary rewards to spy on each other and report any suspicious activity. Those who reported on others and followed the policy themselves got certain benefits, like higher salaries, more government aid, and more employment opportunities, while those who didn't faced discrimination, abuse, and punishments. The policy was further complicated by the Chinese pref cultural preference for sons over daughters. This is because sons carry the family name and they care for parents in their old age, while daughters leave the family once they get married. So, if a couple's first child was a girl, they'd often want to try again for a boy. So they'd abandon their baby girl, or sometimes they'd simply kill her. The killing of baby girls is known as female infanticide, and unfortunately, it was not uncommon in China while this one-child policy was in effect. Now, I'm not trying to insinuate that Chinese people are cold or unfeeling. Many birth parents, with tears in their eyes, would sneak out in the dead of night and leave their child in a place where they knew the baby would be found the next morning. These parents hoped that their child would be taken to an orphanage and given a good life, or at least a chance at life. We must remember that these parents were under enormous pressure from the draconian policies of an authoritarian state, and they agonized over their choices. Many birth parents still express to this day deep regret for those heart-wrenching decisions that they made so many years ago. The one-child policy was supposed to be brief and temporary, but it remained in effect until 2015. It is one of the most influential policies in all of history. In its 35 years of existence, it prevented an estimated 400 million births. China's birth rate is now the lowest it's been since 1949. In fact, it's so low that the government is now incentivizing couples to have more children. But none of this changes the fact that the policy was implemented in a harsh and terrible way and had horrific effects on the hundreds of millions of baby girls who were aborted or were killed after they were born or the tens of millions of baby girls who were abandoned and left to the orphanages. These orphan girls have come to be known as the lost girls of China. You are looking at one of the lost girls of China. I was told that I've been found on a bridge early in the morning one late August day, about two days after being born. I was taken to an orphanage where I lived for nine months. Now, I remember nothing about this orphanage. I was, after all, just a baby. 
but from what I've heard and read, a Chinese orphanage doesn't sound like a great place to raise a child. Most orphanages are terribly understaffed, with limited facilities and resources. In fact, sometimes brought staff is spread so thin that there are only three staff members per 50 children. This means that these kids didn't have the attention, care, or love that is so crucial to developing healthy and happy babies and children. In fact, they received almost no hugs, no kisses, no human contact of any kind. They were just left in their cribs to cry for hours on end. And witnesses say that those who were weak or difficult were left to die in the infamous death rooms. There was little medical and educational support for these children too. So, after years of neglect of receiving only the basic levels of care, these children are released into society with scarcely any opportunities, left to fend for themselves without any societal support. In a culture where the family is reared above all else, an orphan in China is outcast. And the lost girls also serve as a reminder of a very shameful period of Chinese history. It's difficult to imagine the amount of suffering that these orphans, 90% of which are girls, must have faced. Ladies and gentlemen, that could have very well been my fate. That could have very well been my life. But fortunately for me, my fate completely changed when I was adopted by a loving and caring family from America. I now live a privileged life in Barcelona, Spain, a life full of love, care, support, education, and opportunity. Out of the millions and millions of Chinese lost girls, I'm one of the lucky ones. But the lost girls of China are just a fraction of the millions of orphans all over the world. These orphans often find themselves in similarly bleak situations in developing countries, and just like the lost girls. Transracial adoption is often their only hope at escaping an almost certain future of neglect, loneliness, and despair. Sure, being transracially adopted might have some identity issues associated with it, but let's be honest: everyone has issues that they have to deal with. It's a large part of what life is about, and nearly all teens struggle to create a self-identity, regardless of their race or family situation. While being adopted by a family of the same race may have less issues in terms of the racial aspect of the adoption, that doesn't mean that transracial adoption is a horrible practice and should be stopped. The identity issues associated with it are greatly outweighed by the dark realities faced by the majority of orphans in developing countries. And in fact, studies show that, on the whole, most transracial adoptees end up assimilating quite successfully into their new life in a different culture. So maybe these identity issues aren't as bad as they're made to seem. And okay, maybe these white parents won't be able to like relate to their child in every aspect of their racial identity. But that doesn't mean that loving and caring parent parents can't turn to other methods of support to provide necessary understanding. Currently, parents of children who are LGBTQ, who are disabled, or have autism are able to support their children even if they don't have firsthand experience with it. I'd say. That having a loving and caring family who would do anything to help you is more than enough for these children. And while these children aren't completely immersed in their culture of origin, they're not completely cut out of their cultural heritage either. Many countries have measures in place to ensure that children remain connected to their country of origin. For example, when adopted from China, my parents had to take classes on Chinese culture and promise to keep aspects of China into my life growing up. Promises that they've upheld. And lastly. I don't buy the idea that it's a white racist savior complex that's driving these parents to adopt. I think that what's motivating them is their longing to have a child to care for and love and hold. It's their desire to help and love a child desperately in need that drives them to adopt from different races and nationalities, to give them a safe and loving home, and while simultaneously saving them from a life almost certainly filled with neglect and suffering. If we were to stop transracial adoption. We'd be condemning untold numbers of children around the world to a fate that none of us would want for ourselves. Among the millions of orphans in developing countries, only a small fraction, about 135,000, are adopted in the U.S. each year. In Europe, this number is much less and has been declining in recent years, leaving millions of orphans around the world to their own dark fates. Now, I'm not saying that transracial adoption is going to be a walk in the park for every single transracial adoptee, but what I am saying is that, from my personal experience, 
We shouldn't criticize or attempt to prevent a family from adopting a child just because of their race and the fact that it's different than that of the child's. Treating people differently just because of their race is, well, I think there's a word for that. Look, who among us wouldn't happily accept some transracial identity issues in exchange for a life full of love, safety, care, and opportunity, as well as the ability to leave behind a life as an orphan in a poverty-stricken society? If you ask me, we don't need fewer transracial adoptions. We need more of them. Being transracially adopted has changed my life immeasurably for the better. When I think about what my life could have been, what my life would have been, I am so incredibly thankful to my parents, who, motivated by love, flew to the other side of the world to care for and love and raise the little Chinese lost girl that you see before you today. Thank you, mom and dad, and thank you for listening to my story.